Okay, I think uh, we are all here. So, um, if you have finished your assignments, and I hope you have, then please leave them over here uh, towards the end of the lecture so that I can mark them and uh, give you some credit. Now, we finished the basic introduction to crystallography, and today I'm going to move on to stereographic projections, which is a tool that you need in order to visualize three-dimensional things about crystals. So I'll begin by introducing stereographic projections by first of all showing you that when we look in the mirror, it's as if you rotate yourself by 180 degrees, so you become upside down, and then you invert through the center. Okay. So what I want to demonstrate to you is that the mirror image is formed by a rotation at 90 degrees to the mirror plane of 180 uh, rotation, a two-fold rotation, followed by an inversion through the center. Okay, so here is our object. If I take that person and I rotate him by 180 degrees about that axis, then we will generate this object here. Yeah, everyone happy with that? So the rotation is at 180 degrees about the center as illustrated. So I need you to pay attention, please. Those with telephones, yep. It's, it's important in order to understand the stereographic projection. Okay. So here is a person rotated about this axis by 180 degrees and we achieve this object. Okay. Now I've got to take every point on him and invert it through a center. So this clearly isn't a mirror image of that. But if I take that and I rotate, uh, I, I invert every single point to a corresponding point on the other side through a center, then I create a mirror image. So uh, this was the original rotation. We then take every point and we invert it through the center and that gives us this mirror image here, okay? So the total operation to produce a mirror image is that first we have a rotation of 180 degrees followed by an inversion through a center, okay? To produce the mirror image. Is everyone happy with that? Okay, so a mirror image is produced by a rotation of 180 degrees about the mirror plane followed by an inversion through the center. Now that's quite, uh, even though I've drawn some diagrams for you, it's quite difficult to imagine because we have uh, an arbitrary object here with a shape which is not symmetrical and so forth. So we need a better way of describing uh, three-dimensional operations like this. So I'm going to show you a much more simple way of visualizing these operations. But you are convinced so far that a mirror image is the same as a rotation of 180 degrees plus an inversion through a center. Yeah? Everyone happy with that? Okay, so imagine that we have a, a sphere, and in this sphere we have an equatorial. Okay. So this is a, a sphere, and this is the plane which goes through the equator. And this point here is on the surface of the sphere. Okay. If I take that point and I project it through the South Pole, so this is the South Pole, this is the North Pole, just like on the Earth. If I take that point and project it through the South Pole, then it will intersect the equatorial plane at this point here. So if I draw this equatorial plane out, then I've got this point corresponding to this point. Yeah, everyone happy with that? So we've done basically a projection of this point onto the equator, uh, equatorial plane. Now I'm going to do the rotation of 180 degrees about the north-south pole. So here, uh, this is now, the point two is produced by a rotation about the vertical axis of 180 degrees. And 
If I do the same operation, that means I project the point 2, which is on the surface of this sphere, through the equatorial plane, then I get this point here. Yeah? And on this equatorial plane, this point produces this point here. Right? And the angle between these two is 180 degrees, because I've, rotate, I've generated point 2 by a rotation of 180 degrees. Okay, so we haven't quite obtained the mirror plane yet because this is just a rotation of 180 degrees about the vertical axis. I now need to invert this point through the center so that it comes onto the lower hemisphere of this sphere yeah. to do the inversion. Yeah, that's to the center onto the opposite side of the sphere. And if I now project that through the North Pole, because this is in the southern part of the hemisphere, then I get a circle here, which is the circle here. We draw it as an empty circle because it's projected through the lower half of the sphere. Now you can see that this is exactly a mirror plane because the dot on top is reproduced with a circle at the bottom. Right? So this is what we call a stereographic projection. And if we now forget about this three-dimensional diagram, it's very easy. Here, I rotate through 180 degrees about the north-south pole, which is pointing upwards. I produce this point. If I invert it through the center, I reproduce a circle, which is in the lower half of the hemisphere. Okay. And this equatorial plane is the mirror plane. It's at 90 degrees to that two-fold rotation axis. Okay, so that's how we draw a stereographic projection. If you have a point which is in the upper hemisphere, you project it through the south pole. If you have a point which is in the lower hemisphere, you project it through the north pole. Okay. And on these diagrams, you will see later, we are simply representing angular relationships between directions or plane normals. Now, what is the use of the stereogram? Let me uh, before going into detail into stereographic projections, I'll show you some examples which, uh, where we use stereograms extensively. So, of course, this is the Earth, and we don't normally look at uh, the sphere of an Earth to find, you know, where is which city and so forth. We look at some kind of a projection because that's much easier to look at. But notice two things. Okay? One is that this is a rectangle, so it clearly doesn't represent a sphere properly. There will be distortions, huge distortions. So just to illustrate that, you know, if I travel from London to Tokyo, that looks like a long distance compared with if I travel from London to Bangkok. But actually, they are almost identical distances. Yeah? So re recently, I traveled from here to Dubai, and it took... 12 hours, which is the same time it takes me to travel from here to London. Okay. So the distances on a projection are distorted. So whenever we make a two-dimensional projection of a sphere, there will always be some kind of distortion. Okay. So that's the first thing about stereographic projections. You'll see that two points which are apparently at the same distance apart may not actually have the same angular relationships. But of course, this is the map that we use more frequently than looking at the spherical uh, Earth. Now, this is a, a classic piece of work, uh, the original work on the deformation of single crystals done by Schmidt and Boas. You can download their entire book from my website. It's a classic book on crystal plasticity. So basically you take a crystal and you stress it. Now supposing there are 24 possible slip systems, how can I decide which slip system is going to operate? You know, so for example, a cubic crystal like ferrite or austenite will slip on, uh, austenite will slip on 111 planes in the 101 directions. And if you look at all those slip systems, there'll be 24 possible slips. 
systems. How can I decide which one is going to operate? Which one or more are going to operate? Yeah. Any ideas? Now, slip operates by shear, doesn't it? Yeah. Slip means shear. So even though you're applying a tensile stress, that tensile stress will operate through the shear stress that you put on any different slip plane, right? So you've got to resolve that tensile stress as a shear stress on the slip plane. And that plane which, and which will have the greatest shear stress in the slip direction will be the one which operates first. And we'll come to this later, but they were the first people to derive the law which predicts which slip system has the largest shear stress in the shear direction and that's known as a Schmidt factor after Schmidt and Boas. So here is a single crystal, and you can see that it's slipping on a particular set of planes. So I can represent all the slip systems on a stereogram, and I can put the tensile axis on the stereogram, and therefore I can discover which slip system is going to operate first, okay? So I'm not teaching you how to do that as yet, but we will come to that later. So the deformation of single crystals very frequently use stereographic projections to study that. I've shown you this slide before, which shows you how the modulus varies as a function of orientation in the crystal. But I can't look in this diagram at the other side of the diagram, right? Unless I can rotate it, etc. If I had a projection showing the contours of elastic moduli, on a two-dimensional projection, then I could look at every possible orientation and uh, obtain an elastic modulus value. So again, three-dimensional diagrams are not terribly useful unless in your computer you can rotate into different directions and look. But two-dimensional uh, projections are much easier to perceive. Uh, we've already looked at some orientation relationships between the gamma and the gamma prime, where I explained that the cube edges are parallel. So 100 of gamma is exactly parallel to 100 of gamma prime. And that's why, you know, we regarded the turbine blade as a single crystal, even though it contained about 70% of precipitates. So we routinely talk about orientation relationships between precipitates and the matrix, you know, whether it's cementite and ferrite or austenite and ferrite or molybdenum carbide and vanadium carbide, sulfide and so on. They are important in determining the properties of the material and that's why we bother to measure them and to study them and to calculate crystallographic textures and so forth. So these can be represented on a stereographic projection, and I'll show you how to do that. Uh, you've seen many diagrams like this in, uh, in our department, where the color actually represents the crystallographic orientation. But you also have sample axes. So for example, this might be a rolling direction, and this might be the transverse direction. So you can plot then the crystal orientation with respect to the sample axes to show you the distribution of orientations because we very rarely have materials which have a random distribution of crystals. Normally they will be aligned in some way because you've deformed it, you've heat treated it, transformed it in a magnetic field or whatever. It's very difficult to produce a material in which the crystals are distributed randomly of the uh, orientations. Okay. Does anybody know one method of producing a random distribution of polycrystal uh, of crystals? Given that you can't deform, you can't cast, because in casting you have preferred growth directions, powder metallurgy. So you, you make a powder and then you fuse, uh, you join the powder together. If you, if you do too much joining, you will get texture once again, okay? Texture means a non-random uh, distribution of crystals. Uh, diffraction patterns, we'll be coming to them uh, in great detail because in the transmission electron microscope, that's how you 
determine both the crystal structure and the orientation of the precipitates. And again, we can use stereographic projections to analyze those diffraction patterns. Now, the reason why I went to a little bit of trouble to explain to you why stereographic projections are useful is because it's really a tool, okay? And we need to learn how to use tools before we can actually solve problems. If I just go into stereographic projections, you will wonder why we are learning this, okay? So I'm just going to repeat what we did with the twofold axis and the mirror plane. So we start with a point one here, and in order to plot it onto a two-dimensional equatorial plane, we project it through the South Pole if that point happens to lie in the northern hemisphere. Now I do a rotation, so that point on the equatorial plane comes over here. Uh, if I do a rotation of 180 degrees and I project this point again through the South Pole, then I obtain another point on the stereographic projection, which is the consequence of, a of 180 degrees about this axis. Okay. And now, I do the operation which is identified this with, with this bar over here, which is inversion through the center, and that's the point three. And because I'm projecting it through the North Pole, I draw it as an open circle to indicate that it's lying under the equatorial plane. And you can see that this is now exactly a mirror plane because that is a reflection of that point. Okay, so the operation bar two which means a 180 degree rotation plus an inversion through the center is exactly identical to a mirror plane. Now, every plane in this sphere, which has the diameter of the sphere, we call a great circle, okay? So, for example, the equatorial plane that I was talking about is a great circle because its diameter is the same as the diameter of the sphere. Same with this inclined uh, plane. It still has the diameter of the sphere, so it's called a great circle. Now, obviously, there will be another circle which does not have the diameter of the sphere, which we will call a small circle. So, these are circles which have diameters smaller than that of the sphere, and therefore we call them small circles, diameter less than that of a sphere. So this is just terminology that we have to learn. Okay, now I'm going to place a crystal in the middle of our sphere. So here is a crystal, it's one zero zero axis is pointing that way, zero one zero that way, and zero zero one that way, and we'll call this a cubic crystal for the moment. So I've placed my crystal in the, stair, uh, in the sphere, and conventionally this is the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. Now supposing that I want to represent a plane in this, and remember this is the South Pole and this is the North Pole, then I draw my plane. Which plane is this? What are the indices of that plane? Yeah, say it loudly because, uh, yeah. Uh, so it doesn't intersect the uh, x axis, so th we will have an intercept at infinity, so the index is zero. It intersects the y-axis at 1 and the z-axis at 1, so it's the 0, 1, 1 plane. Now, the normal to that plane is, is this here. It's at 90 degrees to this plane. And the intersection of that normal with the sphere I project through the south pole cuts the equatorial plane over there, so I get a dot on that equatorial plane which is the pole of the 0, 1, 1 plane. That means it represents the normal to the 0, 1, 1 plane. So on our stereographic projection, which is this plane, this pole represents the normal to the 0, 1, 1 plane. Okay, everyone happy with that?
If I look at this normal, what are the indices of that normal? It's still the same plane, but the opposite direction. So what would it be? So if I, if I have a vector going this way, which is 0, 1, 1, what's the opposite? 0, bar 1, bar 1. Okay. Uh, I project it through the North Pole and I end up with a circle here. So remember that we had the 0, 1, 1 pole here and this is the 0, bar 1, bar 1 pole. So, if I do that for a certain number of planes, then this is the stereographic projection of a cubic crystal. You can see 0, 1, 1 there and 0, bar 1, uh, bar 1 underneath there. Okay, these are the edges. So this is the 1, 0, 0 pole, okay, the normal to the 1, 0, 0 plane. This is the normal to the 0, 1, 0 plane and this is the normal to the z-axis. So these are all the cube edges basically, aren't they? 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0 and 0, 0, 1. What is the symmetry parallel to that edge? So what is the symmetry of the 0, 0, 1 cubic direction? Rotational symmetry? fourfold because at every 90 degrees you reproduce the cube, don't you? Yeah. So notice that we have fourfold symmetry about this axis of here, here, here and here. You have 0, 1, 1 type directions. Yeah. Similarly, this is the 1, 1, 1 type plane and you can see fourfold symmetry there. If I now focus on uh, this axis here, uh, again, you can see fourfold symmetry because you have this, 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 and the one going into the plane of the diagram. So the stereographic projection will reflect the symmetry of the poles that you have. What is the symmetry of the one, one, one pole in terms of the rotation? So one, one, one is a cube diagonal. threefold and you can see there are three of these great circles passing through the 111 pole okay so everything on here is consistent and the distances here are angular relationships so the angle between this and this is 90 degrees between this and this is 90 degrees between this and this will be 45 degrees it's it's the 011 type plane and between this and this will be about 54 degrees. You can calculate those angles using dot products, for example, vector dot products. Okay. So the way in which these poles were plotted was exactly as I showed you in that diagram, where we have a plane, we draw a normal to the plane, where it intersects the sphere, you project it through the south pole or the north pole, depending on where that point is. One more thing I want you to notice. Plane normals, just like directions, are vectors, right? So this is 0, 0, 1, pointing out of the plane of the diagram. And this is 1, 0, 0, pointing this way. Any vector in between must be the sum of those two. Yeah? Uh, because you only need two vectors to generate another vector on that plane, right? So 1, 0, 1, for example, is a sum of 1, 0, 0 and 0, 0, 1. So on, on this line, I can generate all vectors if I knew two of those. Right? So this is 1, 0, 1, which is the sum of that and that. Similarly, if I add that and that, this, and so on. So you have to be consistent. If this is a plane and all these vectors lie on that plane, then you only need two vectors to generate every other pole on there. I haven't told you how to do these angles, but it's absolutely correct that on any of these circles, I can generate all the others by just adding two of them up. Okay. 
So every great circle represents a plane. Now, this is our plane, the blue, the 0, 1, 1 plane. If I extend it in space so that it actually cuts the sphere at every point, then that would be the 1, 0, 1 plane. Yeah, is everyone happy with that? So this great circle is basically this blue plane extended so that it cuts the sphere. Yeah? Everyone happy with that? Now, at every point where it cuts the sphere, I can project it through the South Pole to obtain a series of points on the equatorial plane. And that is what we call the trace of a plane. So we had the plane normal as a dot over here, and this is the trace of that plane. So we have a plane normal and a plane. And the trace of the plane will be all the points which lie at 90 degrees to the plane normal. So if my pole is over here, every single point on here will lie at 90 degrees. So if I go back one slide, this is the normal to the 100 plane, uh, sorry, 001 plane, and this of course is the 001 plane. So every point on here must be degrees to that. Can you see that if I take a dot product of 0, 0, 001 and bar 100, zero, zero, I get nothing? Yeah? Because a, a vector dot product, when it's 0, means the two vectors are at 90 degrees. Right? If I take a dot product of bar 1, bar 10 zero with 0, zero 001, again, I get nothing. Yeah? So this is the trace of the 0, zero 001 plus plane and this is the pole and everything on here is at 90 degrees to this. Similarly, this is the 101 plane and this is the trace of the 101 plane and everything on, on this trace is at 90 degrees to this. So for example, if I take a dot product between 101 and bar 101, that's also zero because 1 times minus 1 plus 1 times 1 is 0, right? Similarly, if I take a dot product of bar 1, bar 1, 1 with 1, 0, 1, it's also 0. So this is the trace of the 1, 0, 1 plane, okay? This is the 1, 1, 0 plane, and all points on here are at 90 degrees because the 1, 1, 0 plane is cutting vertically through this diagram along there. So the trace of a plane is at 90 degrees to the pole. Okay, so that's the pole and that's the trace. Now, I mentioned to you that when we make projections, there will be distortions, right? Because we are taking a three-dimensional object, uh, and in this case it's a sphere. So when we project it onto two dimensions, you will get distortions. So it's difficult then to measure angles, okay, because uh, on a stereographic projection, there are angles between two points. Yeah, it's an angular projection. So we can calculate all those angles, and this is what we call a wolf net. So it's like a ruler for measuring angles, okay? So supposing I have two points here and here, then I can count that, look, this is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 degrees between those two points. But when I do those measurements, those two points must lie on a great circle. Okay? So I have to rotate this net until those two points lie on a great circle. Otherwise, I will get the wrong information. Yeah? Exactly like the map that I showed you, the distance between London and, um, where was it? Yeah, Incheon. No. I forget what uh, I was plotting, but let's assume it's between, uh, you know, Seoul and London. It was about 9,000 kilometers. And also between Bangkok and London was about 9,000 kilometers. But it looked different on the map. However, if I measured those distances on a great circle, yeah, 
that means one of the uh, longitudes, they would be identical. Okay. So when I want to measure angles using this uh, ruler, I have to locate the poles onto a great circle. If they don't lie on a great circle, then I rotate the wolf net relative to the stereogram until they lie, and then I measure. Okay. Everyone happy with that? Now, for some reason, I can't get movies to work on the PowerPoint presentation, so I'm going to go to my YouTube site to show you uh, some movies. Go away. Yeah. Okay, so here is uh, our stereogram, and now you have a wolf net uh, superimposed. And this is a pole, and the pole lies on this great circle, and I want to measure the angle between the pole and these points here. Okay, So I rotate this point, uh, say, say I want to measure between this and this, then I rotate the wolf net so that these two points lie on a great circle, and in this case the great circle is just this line here. right? Then I can count the angles. So this is 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and 100. Okay? So I need to ensure that the two points lie on a great circle in order to measure the angles. So obviously, obviously there is a mistake in this diagram because it should be 90. This point should actually be lying over here. Okay. Right. Now I'll show you uh, an example where it's not as convenient. So this time we are looking at the 111 pole, and I want to measure an angle of 90 degrees. Oops. So I want to measure uh, the line, uh, the great circle, which is at 90 degrees to that. Okay. So the wolf net is now rotated so that these two points lie on the great circle. Okay. So physical rotation of the wolf net relative to the stereographic projection. Now, we have two points here, which, uh, and I want to measure the angle between those two points. So we rotate them so that they lie on, whoops, a daisy. We rotate the stereographic projection relative to the wolf net so that they lie on the same great circle. Okay, so now we are going to rotate the, uh, the wolf net. So now they are on the same great circle here, and you can measure the angle between those two points. Yep. Can you see they lie on the same great circle? And therefore, you can just count the angle there and measure it. Okay. So this is how you do uh, superimpose a wolf net onto your stereogram in order to measure the angle between two points which are located at an arbitrary position on the stereographic projection. Everyone okay with that? Now, how is this uh, wolf net plotted? Well, uh, I explained to you that these are all great circles, okay? Whereas these are small circles. Now, the radius of this great circle 
in general is greater than the radius of the stereogram. So obviously for this great circle the radius is infinite and then for this great circle it becomes the same as the diameter of your stereographic projection. But all of these will have a radius that is greater than that of the stereographic projection. So, supposing you have a circle, and this is an arc of a circle, then there is a very simple uh, relationship here uh, obtained just from Pythagoras. Okay, so uh, this is r squared, and this is x, and r minus x squared is equal to r squared minus y squared, just by Pythagoras. Okay, so the distance x here will be related to the radius of this circle. And if this is my great circle and this is the stereographic projection, then the radius of the great circle is simply related to the radius of the stereogram by the distance from the center. As x tends to zero, the radius of the great circle tends to infinity. Okay. And when x is equal to the red r, uh, sorry, r naught, the two radii are equal. So this is just so that you understand how to plot a wolf net if you ever need to think more carefully. Okay? But wolf nets you can just download from the website, print them out or obtain them on tracing paper so that you can see through them. Right, so this is just repetition of what I said earlier and how to measure the angle between two points. You locate those two points onto a great circle and then just read off the angle. Right. Now this is, this is quite uh, interesting. If you draw a circle on top of the sphere like this and you do the projection through the south pole, you will get also a circle on your stereographic projection. Okay, so it's a true circle. But the angular center and the geometrical centers do not coincide, right? Because we have a distortion in angle. Okay. Angles here are more widely spaced than angles towards the center. So the angular center of this small circle, that means if I measure the angle this way, that's the same as the angle this way, but that's the geometrical center of that circle. So when we project a small circle onto our equatorial plane, the angular and geometrical centers do not coincide. Now, what is the use of a small circle? Well, if I have a pole located here and I want to find all the other poles located at 25 degrees to it, then I simply draw a small circle on the stereogram with 25 degrees measured this way, 25 degrees measured that way, join up those points, find the geometrical center, and draw a circle. Yeah. So, if I want to find everything which is at 25 degrees to this pole, then I would measure 25 degrees this way, 25 degrees this way, join up those two points, this is the geometrical center, and draw a circle. Okay? And then every point on that circle will be at the same angle to that central point. Okay? This is a, if I want to find uh, a, a pole which is at phi 2 to P2 and phi 1 to P1, then I draw two small circles with the angles phi 1, phi 2, and at the intersection I get the solution. Okay? <coughs> the angle between two planes. Uh, we've already determined by putting a great circle on it and measuring it, okay, reading it off. And of course that's the same as the angle between the traces of those two planes because the trace is simply at 90 degrees to the pole. Now this is uh, our cube again and we have a fourfold axis coming out of the plane of the board this is the 110 type direction going through the plane of the board. 
So that would be a twofold axis, a diet. And this is looking down the body diagonals. So we have a threefold axis of rotation. Uh, these three atoms are above and these three atoms are below the plane of the diagram and that's why it looks like a hexagonal symmetry but it's not actually okay this is a threefold axis of rotation a triad now on a stereographic projection you can represent symmetry elements uh, as shown over here so this is the stereographic projection this is the cube edge and you draw a little filled square to represent a tetrad an object like this to represent a dyad, a two-fold axis, so these are one, zero, one type directions, and a triangle to represent three-fold axes of rotation. So you can see there's three-fold symmetry here. Okay? So that's just a way of representing symmetry elements on a stereographic projection. Now, I don't want you to worry about this, but, you know, I've limited myself to very simple poles like 100, 110, 111, but it's very easy by using the rule about the linear combination of vectors to generate, you know, for example, 331 or 215 and so forth poles on there, okay? So this is, this is a more complicated cubic stereogram. When there is a, a direction which is shared by many different planes, okay, so you've got a single direction with many planes intersecting along that direction, that's called a zone axis. So, you know, if your electron beam is coming down like this and you've got a diffraction pattern with spots on that pattern, then all those spots represent normals to planes. So, all those planes belong to the same zone, whatever the direction of your electron beam is. Okay? So the normal to a diffraction pattern is called a zone axis because it's, it lies at 90 degrees to all the plane normals contributing to that electron diffraction pattern. Okay? So that's, that's the zone axis. So here, for example, this could be the zone axis of all these planes here because they are all at 90 degrees to this axis. So supposing I put my electron beam along this direction, then I would expect to see diffraction from all these planes, assuming that other things make it possible to get diffraction, because there are certain planes which will not contribute to diffraction, because there will be antiphase uh, waves comi coming through. Yeah. So from the stereogram, you know, you could easily draw electron diffraction patterns. All you have to do is identify two planes, okay, which spots correspond to those two planes. Everything else is generated by linear combination of those two. I'll, I'll show you this later on in the lectures. So once you have a stereogram, you know, your electron diffraction patterns are almost defined. You have to take account of structure factors structure factors are things which lead to systematic absences which will come to later but if you have a primitive unit cell then every plane on here will contribute to electron diffraction okay. primitive unit cell means you know you just have a primitive unit cell with a motif which is just a single atom at every single lattice point then every plane on here will contribute to your diffraction pattern in other cases, there will be some systematic absences, which I'll teach you how to take account of. Okay, so this might be a new concept to you, but the principle is very simple. And once you start using the stereographic projections, as we will do, it will sink in a lot better. Okay. Now, some of you came late, so please leave your assignments over here so that I can grade you and give you the necessary credit, okay? Thank you.